1930s, my mother Kate, her sisters Gerda and Ilse, and their mother Hanna fled Germany ahead of the war and Holocaust that descended on Europe in the latter 30s and into the 1940s. They arrived in the United States with the few possessions they were able to take with them and their stories of a life and world they'd left behind. It was those stories that I grew up with, that sense of having been uprooted, of having to start life anew in a different land and culture, and the injustice that gave rise to all that, that shaped in part how I saw the world, and it primed my desire to understand those terrible storms that swept Europe and the world, and which has left such a major impact on all that has followed. In the year 2000, I made a trip with my wife Sharon to Europe and a small town in Germany where the stories I'd heard were mainly centered. I was driven by our curiosity to understand more fully what had gone on there and to see the places that I'd only imagined from the descriptions I'd heard of them. Arriving in the small town of Breidenbach with several pictures of an old house and the family that had left decades before, we were fortunate to meet a few people who remembered that time or who had taken an interest to know about it. And from them, we learned some important and even shocking things about what had gone on there in those dark days. It was during that trip that I decided that the story of what happened in that village needed to be passed on to those who will never have any direct connection with that era. Those who lived through and remember those times around World War II are now few, and our connection with that era largely resides in the stories that they have left behind. It is a few of these stories that will be told here, in the words and at times the voices of those who live the events that will be hereby described.
after my after uh, Herman's father passed away, my father and mother got married, and they he took over the business. Yeah, he uh, had a uh, horse and wagon, and had the very much I think of the merchandise in there, and then from one town to the other. But uh, not uh, not to stores, but to private people. See, a lot of these places had big farms, and they hired maids to work there. The girls who I don't, men I don't know, but the, the girls who were who worked there, they had a, a contract. Every there was every year that kind of that. They got so much money and so much on clothing and so much on material and so much on things for their their dowry. That's that's the way they paid their people. And they would sell that to the to the farmers and they in return gave it to the girls who worked for them. <laughs> Liegt in den Augen immer bei einer schönen Frau. Doch wenn sich meine Augen bei einem vis à -vis ganz tief in seine Saugen, was sprechen dann sie? Ich bin... Vater, das Kind war gut. Das war sehr meine Welt. Und sonst gar nicht. I remember my grandparents too. My grandfather had whiskers and then he kissed me and tickled me. <laughs> and then my grandmother lived with us. She punished us more than my mother, but she was very strict, but she was very courageous too. Like one at one time, I remember. There was a, a clapping on the ceiling as if somebody is walking. And we got so scared. And she took her candle and went up the stairs and a, and a stick in her hand. And when she came up there, we had cake, a cake there on a chair in, in, the, in the cake dish. And the cop made a noise. My grandfather, his fa my father's father, lived to ripe old age. My father's father was a religious man, and he came mostly every Passover and made Seder for us. He wasn't really very close to us, but that much he did for us. He made his living as a butcher. His name was Jacob Roth. His wife died very young of a heart attack. I was still a little girl then. Her maiden name was Stiefel. The family of my grandfather on my mother's side came originally from Sp Spain. That was a long time ago, probably that time that they had all that trouble in Spain, the Inquisition. The other grandmother's maiden name was Goldschmidt. Esther Goldschmidt was very popular and she loved to dance. In our town, a dance was named after her. It was called the Esther Waltz. She already was very forgetful. She didn't know that she, she cooked, but she didn't bring us anything. She always wanted to go home. And one day I said to my mother, why don't you let her go home? We'll follow her. And we did. And she walked to a house where she originally was born. Exact spot where that house was, she walked from. I 
when he had to leave for the war. Everybody was so excited. And we were excited too because the grown ups were excited. So, and I couldn't say goodbye to my father. I crawled under the bed. I didn't know what was going on, but I was scared because everybody was so excited. The war started August 1st, 1914, and we had to leave, I think, on the 7th, 7th of August, in 1914. Because he was a soldier, he was already, had been in the army when he was a young fellow. He wasn't old then, when he died, he was in his 30s. So he must have been 14, he must have been beginning of the 30s. My mother's friend told her she's not, she doesn't have to worry. She's not in danger. That's what people said. <laughs> When my father died, my mother took over the business. Very little came in through this. She got some pension money from the government, but we never had much. After the war, you couldn't get things. And we would go to farmers. My mother was very friendly with them, and they would give us this or that. But they were searching the houses for the food or whatever we were in the last flower. So my mother would bury it under wood. And we children were told, don't you dare open your mouth. Later, I don't know when that was, everything was scared. You know, we, but we had enough to eat. And there was a holiday and we had baked cakes. And because the police were going from house to house searching for food, we hid the cakes under a chair, and my grandmother sat on top of the chair. I remember that we all had the flu, the grip that time called, when the soldiers came back, and we were all laid up. The next town there was a big farm, and we got that nut that was, was all under the table. My mother took me along at night with the flashlight. We, in the dark, we had to they put it in, in bush, but my mother knew which bush, and I asked her a question, I don't know anymore what it was. She took the flashlight and 
hit me in the face because I said something which I wasn't supposed to say, but I don't remember what was. People, we always really had something to eat. We never were, I do not recall ever starving. But I know that my mother used to give us, when we went to school, a slice of bread and maybe a slice of salami. And there were people in town who didn't even have that much to eat. So she would say to us, hide the salami. Put it under the bread. Don't show it to the other children, otherwise they will feel bad. My mother was pretty strict with us. My father had died when I was just three years old. Gerda was eight, Kate just two. I'll tell you another thing that happened around the time that my father died. We got an apron, a black apron, but so big that it had to be turned over and made sure that every year for the next couple of years that apron was made longer. I still was using that apron when I went to school. My mother was not active in anything. She was just a plain housewife, father and mother, you would could say, who was friendly and uh, socialized with uh, the neighbors and the friends, but very friendly with the Gentile neighbors as well as the Jewish people. I had fights with Peter and Gala. So I remember one time I went into the basement and was supposed to get potatoes. Nobody else wanted to go, so I had to go. I think he and Jenna were always afraid, or they just didn't want to do so much work. I don't know which. We had in our bedroom like a little hole, and they would open it up and say, ah, ah, ah. and I took the rotten potatoes and threw them <laughs> I was quite rough. I remember my mother one day punished me and put me in the bedroom and I jumped out of a window which was not a low window. I don't, I'm surprised I survived. I remember rolling down the hill in back of our house and tearing my dress. My mother's friend sewed it up for me. My mother would have hit me for tearing my dress. This friend of my mother's had seven children but still would always have time for us if we needed her. Everybody in town was pretty poor. Uh, my mother had a big garden and other fields. We had through that a lot of vegetables and bought one to eat meat. And in a cold basement, some of the meat was kept, uh, sometimes salted away to make uh, pickles. Meat, we would eat it that until it was finished. Well, my mother took the business over and it's just the business from the house. We had shoes, we had needles, and we would call it five and ten. When Greta was bigger, she opened up a grocery store, also in the, you know, right from the, from in the house. We had a big house. My mother would get up at three in the morning to do the laundry on rocks in our garden. We baked our bread and cake in the community oven. The oven was not far from our house. And there was a well near there. Sometimes in the summertime, we had no running water. I remember a neighbor we had named Maria. She was very good to us. She turned on the lights for us on Friday nights and heated our food on Saturdays when Shabbos prohibited us from doing that. The sun thunderstorms there were very severe. My mother would take books from the business, money, and important papers and put them in a sack on a table along with a prayer book and salt. I don't, do not know the meaning of the salt. was uh, on the end of the town and above it was the synagogue which was absolutely nothing but two rooms. 
with the uh, Taurus in it. And yeah, that teacher was very, very strict. He was not a good teacher. Mm-hmm. He maybe deserved a lot from him, but he was very strict. In one room, eight, play, eight years, the same teacher mm-hmm. for the eight classes, eight different years. Aside from two years, we went to the general school. We were there. I remember in the first or second year, and it could have been both, we had a Jewish teacher who was not nice to the children. When, when he had a fight with the parents, and the children would come to school, he would pick them up on their neck and he would feed them. He had a long stick, and they had to hold out our hands, and he would hit our hands. And every morning I cried. And every other day I would play sick. And every time the teacher went someplace else, we would go into people where there were Gentile children. And those children bothered us a lot. They called us dirty names. They threw stones at which we drew back. (laughs) I had a lot of Gentile friends. And they were very nice. But there were others there which were bullies, and they were the ones who would throw rocks at us. Went to a Jewish school, private more as a private school. But then after a few years, we, we went into the other schools. Because once we went in the other schools, there was a little bit of an anti-Semitism. Many times the teacher would say in the morning, get me the Jewish, Jewish girl, or something like that. I never went to high school. We only had public school. With 14 years, I ran the way and wiped for the people. Ilse went to Hamburg. She took a job as a governess. Kate and I changed off for a few years in taking jobs so that one of us was home all the time. Doch das Messer sieht man nicht. I was in Hamburg seven years, I think. Okay, I took care of children. First, I was working for a doctor. I had two children. The one was a baby. The other one was also about two or three years old. And took care of them. Went to the park with them. Had once a week free, maybe a half a day. <laughs> From one job I went and didn't like it there, I went to another job, took care of a child who was deaf and dumb uh, until he was able to go to school. Another uh, dentist, uh, had, he had five children, mm-hmm. but there were two already bigger, you know, they didn't need any help, only the uh, smaller ones. Witwe, deren Namen jeder weiß, wacht auf und war geschändet. Mecki welches war sein Preis. One night that I was in a place outside of Hamburg, and we had and we had missed the last bus, so we had to sleep there. During the night, the Nazis were marching there. If I tell you the chills went down your back when you heard the marching and singing. I 
went to business school in Fulda, which is a city not so far away. I was there a half, half a year in that business school. For one and a half years, two or three years. At 16, I went to Stuttgart. Yeah. I went back to school there in, in boarding school and uh, stood with my uncle. In Stuttgart, I went to a Catholic school mm -hmm. for girls. There were all different religions there. And at that time, I remember, it was just at the time before Hitler, when he came to Stuttgart, and all the young girls in our school, they all said they were going to go see him. Out of curiosity, I went along. I, it was amazing mm -hmm. what a crowd he threw. You know, it was absolutely amazing. I was 16 years old. Everybody shouting Heil Hitler and, mm -hmm. and against the Jews, of course, mm -hmm. and that he was going to uh, change the whole country. And it was a very bad time at that time. We come ohne Plan nicht aus. Deutschland, Sie Heil! Sie Heil! Sie Heil! Deutschland, Sie Heil! In 1926, Omar died after being a bed patient for almost two years. I actually had spent many years of my youth helping Mama to take care of Omar, and it was no picnic. Then came a time when Mama had some physical trouble again. This time was female trouble. The same day she was taken to the hospital, I had to travel to attend my grandfather's funeral. When I came to the hospital the next morning, I was told that Mama's heart was very weak and she was a very sick woman. I blamed myself for going to the funeral and not staying with Mama. After a few weeks, Mama started recovering. I guess by now, we were getting slowly to the Hitler regime. At first, we did not believe what was said and what we read in the paper. We they come to take the shoes away. We left. We thought that could be possible. But when we realized that the people were actually afraid to come to our store to buy anything, or even to be seen with us, we realized that it had gotten serious. to show up. And uh, so they would always send me to these things. 
when you go into the building, you didn't know, should you make Heil Hitler or shouldn't you? If you don't say Heil Hitler, you might get punished. If you do say Heil Hitler, you might get punished because they know you. But since they didn't know me, I, I went in, I put my arm up, pretended to not care. And I wasn't there very long. I was only there for about six months. I remember around that time going to a city named Kessel, which was nearby, to a movie with a friend of a cousin. When we came out of the movie, we were put in jail. They knew that he was Jewish, but they thought that I wasn't. We had to stay in jail until we could call up the mayor of my hometown to verify who I was, and then they let us go. One of my friends who lived in a town called Obala, we decided we we were going to have a little party. It's about uh, 30, 40 miles from the, uh, for kilometers. We decided they decided we were going to have a little party. One of the families had a party and invited us. All of them. rocks into the windows. We were laying on the floor. I had all the glass over in our hair. I was staying there with, with a cousin, and we were afraid to go home. And then finally, when we noticed everything was very quiet, several of the people who lived in town took us, walked home with us. But it was a very terrible experience. And then a few days later, one of the girls left for the United States. Somebody tried to shoot into the house. She left for the United States. I have met her in New York many years back. It was in 1933. There I was working with children. First I was there with their family. They were very Orthodox Jews. Their name was Puchtwanger. He was a cousin of the, the writer Puchtwanger. His books were burned in Berlin. <laughs> And while I was there, when I was working there, they have one son, he was he was a he became a rabbi. He went to a rabbinical school in Poland, I think. And uh, he used to write to his mother from there in Hebrew. One of the cards in Hebrew from her son was left by mistaken in a library book that she had borrowed from the library. Somebody found the card. The SS came to the house. But nothing happened to her at the time. She just explained to them that she had left the card in the book accidentally. I don't know what happened to the family later on. In, in Hamburg itself, is a big city, you really didn't notice it. And unless you were personally uh, affected, you didn't notice that much. You noticed much more in the small town when I came home. There was no other place you could go to have a cup of coffee anymore, you, not, you couldn't go swimming in an in a open swim, swimming pool. There were the theater, the movie houses, everything that Jews were not allowed. <laughs> Thank you. 
es nicht so schwer. Ich danke dir. already 34, 35, and things got worse at home. A lot of people try to, to immigrate. Not always possible, but my, most of them were good for to immigrate. Um, he had a neighbor. His father was a, a mailman. He was, he was a student. He had to belong to the uh, Nazi, call it Nazi youth group. And he would always know what was going on. He always would come and tell me. One day there was a Jewish girl who lived in Frankfurt from family. Her parents lived on, on a street where the children passed the house to school. The children were taught making dirty, her mom's dirty too. She was cleaning her mother's windows and she sprinkled them with water. He told me, tell her to, to leave town. They're going to pick her up in town and take her all through town and going to humiliate her. She didn't believe me. And they really did. They took her all through town with a sign on, I'm a dirty, the dirtiest Jew in this town. And, and they spit on her and you name it. There were a lot of people who did not turn on us. None of our neighbors were ever nasty to us. As a matter of fact, one time the neighbor's son came by and left a note, don't go too close to the window tonight, something is going to happen. Sure enough, all the windows were broken. That was in 1936. After that, we were sent a note telling us that we had to have the windows fixed immediately because they didn't want anyone who came for the Olympics to pass by and see what was happening. My father had one sister and two brothers. The sister of his, my aunt, along with her husband and one son, never got out. They perished in a concentration camp. One brother, my uncle, lived in Breidenbach. He died of pneumonia during the Hitler time. His wife and the youngest daughter later perished in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. The oldest son went to France and was killed there by the Nazis. But the oldest daughter and the youngest son made it to Argentina. My cousin, the youngest son, whose name is Lothar Roth, told me the story of how he got out of Germany when we were in Buenos Aires a few years ago. One of the Nazis in, in Rheinland made it dirty remarks to him. He was very upset. It was just a day after his father was buried. And he beat him up. Mm -hmm. And same night, our mayor in town, who originally was in, in the army with my father, and his father, sent a note to his mother and asked him to leave town after him. So he left town with another Jewish boy from town, my bicycle. And middle of the night they left. And they were after them. But they were lucky enough to hide. They couldn't find them. And they drove with a bicycle to a town called Lurach. Which is on the border with Switzerland near Basel. My cousin's friend had a brother there, and they ended up staying with his friend's brother until he drove my cousin over to Basel. In Basel, he could not get a permit to work, but he found a kosher butcher in town who had been an apprentice along with his father, and this butcher took him in under the table. Lothar had an uncle from his mother's side who had a butcher shop in Kassel. This uncle got a permit to immigrate to Argentina with 10 people. They had to agree to live in the country on a farm to get this permission. Lothar wrote to his uncle that he and his friend were ready to go with him to Buenos Aires. Lothar's sister Irma, who lived in Berlin with her husband and their little girl, also got out that way. I knew a few friends who were social democrats and they were being constantly watched. I knew of one of our religious teachers and another fellow from my town who were supposedly listening to Russian radio and they were put into prison for it in 1935 or 36. That teacher eventually got out, but I never found out what happened to that other man. Several Social Democrats who were top people in the Social Democratic Party in my town disappeared. I don't know what happened to them. There was one fellow who was always being threatened to be put in jail. I don't know what happened to him. This created an atmosphere of fear. 
you were worried sick. You didn't even want a radio where you could listen to another country, especially as a Jew. If you had a radio, you wouldn't dare put it on for fear of getting caught. Oh, my mother got into trouble once. When Ilsa was engaged to Sally, his mother and brother lived in another small town. And they had asked me to go and help the mother pack. And all of a sudden, I'd get a phone call from my mother. I should come home immediately. We had tried to get a little money out. There was a fellow whom uh, Ilsa and I, we knew him from Hamburg, whose parents lived in Hamburg. Very poor, poor people. When he came to the United States, he right away got a job and went to Mexico and he made nice money. So he sent mother and father money. Ilsa found out that he sent his mother money. So she said, why don't you let my mother send your mother the money and, I give, and, and you give me the money and I put it aside for me. He said, they were reading those letters. They found out that my mother sent money there, and that money did not come from the United States anymore. My mother always used to go then on Saturday morning to the temple. Somebody picked her up in the temple, one of the SSRs at Amman, and took her home and asked her some questions. Luckily, she, she found an answer. She said, my daughter had a very big dentist bill, and this boy paid for the dentist for her. And then again, the, uh, the, the mayor in town was very, very close to us, but for my mother, who said she would never say anything wrong and can believe her. That was her luck. Could have been put in jail. Uh, when I left, at that time already windows were uh, broken from the Jewish people, and you heard more and more what Hitler was going to do. And we were very much surprised that a lot of people didn't want to leave, didn't believe what was going to happen. There's one thing that I remember vividly, that one of the guys who were our age was standing in front of our house in club playing. He was happy that I was leaving. A very dumb fella, he was an Nazi. Ilse came in 1934, and after that, Goethe decided she wanted to come. They sent her papers. Goethe came in 1935. After that, everything got worse in my hometown. I wrote for the papers. Ilse, they sent me the papers, and as I got my papers, my mother said she wouldn't stay home alone anymore. Then I wrote them to send mother the papers. My uncle, who was very close friends, the head of the consulate in Stuttgart, and took the papers right through and called her in uh, very soon. At that time, because we didn't need any numbers, later on, it was such a demand to go to the United States that a lot of people had numbers, and that's why a lot of people couldn't get out there. And after I got the papers being sold, whatever we could, and brought a lot of furniture along, so my mother could open up a, an apartment and rent, and rent out rooms and have room on board on borders to make a living. The uh, uh, rent she got from Germany at that time from my father who was killed in the war, that money she could never get out. And our neighbors would come in and buy all the furniture we had. We had such gorgeous antiques. It would be priceless today, which we sold for hardly anything. My people came at night and picked up everything at night. They were afraid somebody would see them and would uh, tell on them. I had a very bad experience on a train on my way to visit my cousin in Frankfurt in the beginning of 1936. There were always a lot of people on that train between Fluta and Frankfurt, a lot of Jewish people. There was an SS man on the train that we were on. A Jewish girl was sitting next to me and the SS man came by and threw her out and asked me to go into the dining room and have coffee with him. I didn't know what to do. I finally told him I wasn't hungry and I didn't want anything. I was glad when that train reached Frankfurt. When I left my hometown, I had to go back once more. There was certain papers we needed, and I went back to my hometown, and we had a cat, which we had given away to some friends. 
and I walked the street and who was right behind me the cat. <laughs> when we came over by boat, uh, Ilsen and uh, Greta both went on a German boat, only because they were afraid it might be trouble for us if they would have taken a, a foreign boat. But since we were the last one in the family, we took a number of boats from the United States. And on the, on the boat, you know, there were two friends, both of their daughters were on there. They had asked me to ask my mother to take, to watch over them. So, and they were the first ones, uh, my mother, who became seasick <laughs> on the boat. Mm. They were sick from the first day to the last. My mother <laughs> and those two girls, and I looked after them. I was the, I was one of the very few who didn't get seasick. Mm. They used to tie on all the chairs. I would put my mother in the morning to, on, boat, uh, on top, because our fresh air is the best thing for, mm. for seasickness. We would bring her the food up, to have somebody bring her up here. And leave her up there all day. Then when we got up New York, everybody came crawling out of their seasick bed. And some of them looked just terrible, pale as can be. My uncle Ilse and Sally, they all were right there, picked us up. We had to stay with Ilse when we got to New York because um, our furniture wasn't there yet. And as soon as the furniture came, my mother would move into Washington Heights into an apartment, which they had rented already before we came. that was impressed upon us as children were that we would never go to Germany, that Germany killed our people, and even though we were Jews welcome in the community, that we were not welcomed uh, once Hitler came. The one thing that we were definitely impressed by our parents was First of all, to assimilate into the American community, to know that we were Germans, and yes, but that was something very, very background. That was not who we were now. We were now Americans. We were always Jews, and that was very important to be proud of, but we must be Americans. We must eat the way the Americans eat, speak English correctly, get as much education as we can, and be of service. Always be proud uh, and be of service so that we could be accepted. Yep. As, a, as a small child, uh, my grandmother was living with us, and the kid next door would say, Heil Hitler, and she would just go totally ballistic, and I didn't understand it because I was probably about five years old. But I do understand it now. And she rightfully was angry. She was made to leave her homeland. Where I see this is my homeland. I went to Vietnam. I fought in Vietnam. You know, I didn't see too much action there. I was there. 
but we had a an uncle here in the city who said that if anything happened to me, it was my mother's fault. And that enraged me. It wasn't my mother who did anything to get me out of going to Vietnam. I felt it was my obligation. This was my country. And even though I later felt the war was wrong, being it was my country, it was my obligation to serve. As I grew older, knowing what went on in Germany and the family members that were lost and what they had to go through, I think it's influenced me most by the way I see the plight of other people and I can feel for these other people. When I was younger, I didn't feel that way, but now I understand. And right now, it's what's going on in the world and us fighting. I feel for those people over there who are getting killed. And I feel for our own troops who are getting killed because this war is so stupid. Any war is stupid. If we could only get minds to understand that. I grew up in a uh, German-Jewish neighborhood in New York City um, and went to uh, Hebrew school. I'm not a religious person. I, Hebrew school was not, did not, was not the right venue for me. Uh, but I can, I've always considered myself a, a Jew, uh, but not, not a particularly observant one. Uh, but being a Jew, being coming out of the Holocaust ha has colored uh, my entire being. I've, I ended up being president of the uh, Jewish Federation in Orange County. We moved to California when I was 11, and my father uh, suggested that I be careful because we were Jewish and there weren't that many Jews in California. And that was going into seventh grade. Well, that's a pretty important time in your life as an adolescent, and you're pretty wary. Uh, so I kind of went into a shell uh, in junior high and high school. I protected myself. I don't think I let people know I was Jewish in school, although I was very involved in youth groups and whatever in the Jewish community. So I had a, a halfway decent social life, but none of it was at school. When I got to college, it all changed. It was more of a mix, and I, uh, I felt a lot more comfortable. But I never really ran into overt acts of anti-Semitism. I think, first of all, my parents coming to this country from Germany with, if you can picture literally the clothes on their back, um, my mother was able to bring some furniture, but, but very little and then having to work very, very hard to make a living. Um, I think I'm conservative because of the hard times I saw them go through and how hard they had to work. Uh, coming to California in 1938, I was uh, four and a half. Um, we knew no one coming out here to California. We um, had no family here. Um, my father had made some friends when he was in the Seabees, so he had a few friends. There was very little support. And um, I think that being Jewish, uh, I felt I was different. And uh, obviously I felt more comfortable being around my family and people that we did know that were Jewish. I went to a school where there was only one other Jewish girl and she became my best friend, Martha Ludwig. And um, I think the fact that we lived in a neighborhood that we didn't uh, assimilate with, um, <clears throat> we weren't able to have a lot of Jewish people around us. Um, growing up, my father told me about his days as a salesman in Germany and the anti-Semitism that he encountered 
And growing up, I felt guarded about letting people know I was Jewish, I, not knowing how they felt. Uh, I think that my father's strong commitment to Israel and um, his strong commitment to making sure that we had a strong Jewish community was also a very large influence on my life because my grandparents could not escape Nazi Germany, the survival of Israel became a big part of his life. And um, I think that my parents instilled in us very important values like tolerance for people who were less fortunate or who were different and compassion for people who were less fortunate. Right. I remember when I was a kid, my mother saying to me that you'll always be a Jew because Hitler went three generations back. And that kind of st stuck and made me remember things. Um, and one, one, of the, one of the things that I, that the how it's affected me is that I have a gun in this house. And, um, and that's because um, if things change around in this country, I'm not going to go into a concentration camp. And that was always my feeling when I was a kid, that, that nobody is going to make me, you know, even if it means my life, I would rather die than, than die the way a lot of Jews died in, in concentration camps. Um, it also makes me appreciate the freedom that I have. Um, even though this country has a lot of problems, you can still voice what you believe in and talk about what you believe in. So, and that for me is very, very important. I remember when I was a kid, um, I saw pictures of um, the um, soldiers um, rescuing um, the adults who looked like children because they were so deprived. and and. And it made me realize that you, that you really have to fight for what you believe in and that you really have to stand up for what you believe in and stand up for your rights. And I think that that has affected me so that I do. I stand up for people's freedoms. I fight for whatever I can in my own way. I don't go out and blow up buildings, but I certainly fight for what I believe in. And I think that that's what we all have to do. We walked through the streets, and my mother recognized every single person in that village who was over 50 years old. They either didn't recognize her, or they pretended they didn't recognize her. Um, and as we were walking down the road, she would say to me anecdotes. This person did that, and that person did that. I remember one story of a a woman who got a fright and she dumped uh, a pot of uh, boiling soup on her husband and nearly killed him. Um, uh, she would normally, she would say, uh, this person was good, he, he was helping the Jews. Uh, this person wasn't good, uh, he was part of the Nazi party. Uh, she had something to say about everyone. Two or three people stopped us and tentatively recognized her. Uh, we could tell that they were very, very embarrassed talking with us because of what happened uh, to all the Jews in Nazi Germany. They were very, very embarrassed that here was a figure from their past coming back, and it wasn't a very happy past. Well, coming from a, an immigrant family, especially one that was forced to leave their homeland, had a huge impact and has had a huge impact all my life in the way I've looked at the world and uh, looked at myself in relationship to the rest of the world. At that time, when I was young, there were very few uh, Jews in, uh, in the community and the high, junior high school I was going to. Uh, I only knew of one other besides myself. Um, and the kids used to play this kind of cruel game where they'd throw pennies on the ground and if you picked it up, you were a Jew. Of course, the Students had no idea what a Jew was. They didn't know a Jew from a Martian. But, but it was enough for me to, um, to become very defensive and, and shy about the fact that uh, I had come from that kind of a background. And the kind of feeling of being marginalized and being um, 
uh, discriminated against, you know, sort of internalized itself with me. I remember in high school, uh, I became aware of the, the civil rights movement. It was beginning to make its mark uh, in the society and throughout the country. And I very strongly gravitated towards that. Um, and I felt a real kinship towards, uh, uh, you know, black people, uh, a real kind of identification with what uh, they were going through. Like the fact that, uh, you know, our family had been victimized by this kind of mindless racist stuff, you know, made me uh, sympathetic to that movement. And, um, and as I got older and, and went to college uh, and started getting active and in, in different uh, social movements against racism and, and, and against the war in Vietnam in particular, um, and became more and more aware of uh, some of the ills of the society, I, I you know, I, I very, I took a very strong um, partisan attitude towards people who were fighting for, for, better, for a better world, for better, more justice. And I realized um, as through study and through discussion with people and um, that what, would, what had happened in Germany and what was happening in the United States, there was a certain connection there. It was a certain connection in a kind of society that both Germany and the United States are. And that uh, if we want to get rid of this kind of uh, insanity, uh, racial divisions and hostility among people, that we've got to get rid of, that we've got to you know, change this kind of society. After arriving in Frankfurt in June 2000, I, my wife Sharon, and her sister Shirley rented a car and drove 90 miles to Breidenbach am Hertzberg. The countryside in central Germany in the state of Hessen was lush green dotted with very tidy little villages. We walked around Breidenbach with a few pictures from my mother's album and asked people on the street, who looked to be the right age, if they recognized the pictures. One of the house grandmother Hannah and her daughters lived, another of the four of them. We didn't have much luck since we couldn't understand people's comments. A few passing bicyclists stopped to help since they spoke some English, but a few older men who were sitting near the side of the old house seemed either not to know or not be interested. We went to the bank where the house once stood. It was closed as this was Father's Day in Germany, even though it was the middle of the week. A few fellows we met on the street, more my and Sharon's age, were well along in their Father's Day celebration, beer apparently playing a big part in that. One of them said his father had been injured on the Russian front during the war, but they didn't have much to say about the subject we were most interested in. We saw a neighbor who lived across from the bank, which had been the house, 
but he'd had a stroke a few years ago and his memory was poor. We were referred to the mayor of the town, but he was off celebrating Father's Day in another town. So it seemed we had run out of options. We went to the little cafe next to the bank for some coffee and I showed the woman serving us the picture of the house that once stood next door. She said little I understood except, wait. She got on the phone and then said, wait, again. Wait ten minutes. And less than that, a thin man in his seventies came through the door. He introduced himself as Heinrich Hassenflug, a name I found that was easier to pronounce than spell. Heinrich was the town historian, and he brought with him the book he'd spent years writing and putting together. Seven hundred years, Breidenbach am Hertzberg. Mr. Hassenflug saw the picture of the old house and he immediately began talking about Hanschen and the candy he bought as a child in her little five and dime. And about Hanschen's three daughters. Did they all emigrate to the U.S., he asked. Heinrich brought us to the Jewish cemetery, to the house of the von Dornbergs, descendants of the robber barons who owned the Hertzberg Castle. Showed us the building that housed the Jewish synagogue and school and took us to some of the houses which had once been homes to Jewish families, pointing out the Jews had lived in Breidenbach since 1690. He took us to the house of Hans Wiefenbach, who I knew from Ilse. He was the one who warned my mother to stay away from the windows in 1936. He then took us to a house down the street from the bank, to where the Roth family had lived. Here's what he told us. Sein Beruf ausgeht. Er war Batscher, er war Metzger und war der Bruder von Hanschen. Hanschen war der Owner von der Little Truck Store. Ja. Und ich habe in meiner Jugendzeit gehört, dass sein Sohn eine hohe Tapferkeitsauszeichnung hat im, im Ersten Weltkrieg, World War I. Und es waren noch einige jüdische Männer vom Dorf, die im Ersten Weltkrieg in der deutschen Armee, im deutschen Heer gekämpft haben. Und die hatten alle das eiserne Kreuz erster Klasse, First Class. Es waren tapfere Männer. Aber es hat sie nicht davor gerettet und davor geschützt, dass sie nicht in die Vernichtungslager kamen. Okay. My father, my father, my mother, were Christen. They have in this dorf manchmal gegen die Leute von den Nationalsozialisten treu zur Kirche gestanden. Und ich weiß, dass meine Mutter an einem Tag in 1938 gesagt hat: 1938, wir können nicht Christen sein, wenn wir tatenlos zuschauen, wenn die jüdischen Menschen Hunger leiden. Dann hat mein Vater gesagt, das kann doch nicht sein. Du weißt doch, es ist ein Polizeistaat. Überall sind Polizei, überall ist Denunzianten. Wie können wir denn den Juden Lebensmittel geben? Dann hat meine Mutter gesagt, das ist ein Akt des Gehorsams gegenüber Jesus Christus. Wir tun in einen Sack Lebensmittel, Brot, Kartoffeln, wie heißen Kartoffeln? Potatoes und äh, Wurst und Fett und Zwiebeln. Und diese Dinge wirst du abends zu den jüdischen Menschen bringen, die wir kannten im Dorf. Ich kann ihnen die Häuser nachher noch zeigen. Und der Vater sollte sie abends in den Vorgarten werfen. Wie würden, wir, wir würden man sagen, im Vorgarten, Lebensmittel? Ja. Und äh, es dauerte, er ist abends leise dorthin gegangen, hat die Lebensmittel hingeworfen. Und am nächsten Tag sind die jüdischen Menschen zu uns gekommen, mein Vater hieß Ludwig, und haben gesagt, wir haben das verstanden, was du uns geschickt hast. Du willst uns helfen, dass wir diese schlimme Zeit besser durchstehen. Und am nächsten Tag kam noch jemand. Der verantwortliche Ortsgruppenleiter, Funktionär vom, National, vom Nazi. 
Und er sagte, im Nachbarhaus hatte ich jemanden gesehen. Du hast den Juden etwas gebracht. Und da sagt mein Vater, ja. Was ihr mit ihnen macht, wir haben dir nichts mehr zu essen. Und da hat der Mann zu ihm gesagt, dich bringe ich ins KZ. Nur weil er geholfen hat, den jüdischen Menschen. Das hat mein Vater erlebt. Okay. Und ich kann Ihnen auch noch die Judenschule zeigen, die Synagoge, wenn Sie das interessiert. Ja, die Synagoge. Im Dorf. Hier im Dorf hat keine Synagoge gebrannt. Weil der alte Vetter, der Bürger... Mr. Hassenflug told us that in 1939, the Jews who remained in Breidenbach were gathered together in the Rothhaus before they were deported to the death camps. This was a detail that those who'd managed to get out early were spared. Heinrich Hassenflug invited us to his home for coffee and cake. He told us that his father had been friends with the Jewish teacher, Mr. Stern, and that he, Heinrich, had been friends with Stern's son. Later, he took us to the house of Barbara Lidner, another close neighbor, who invited us into her home. That is Gerda. No, Gerda? Yeah. Kete? Kete Ilse. Ilse. Uh, Kede. 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 Yeah. Kede. Yeah. Yeah. And, um... This is the house. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. This is Kede. Mm -hmm. And Le uh, Leopold. Yeah. Do, do you remember Leopold? Uh, yeah, that is the man for the for the Hanschen. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Hanschen, yeah. And is in Krieg gefallen. Mm -hmm. Also, mein Vater is in Krieg heim und gestorben hier. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. Und die zwei gute Freunde. Mm -hmm. Gute Freunde. Good ja. Good Und äh, wir waren arm. Und Hanche, die Garderobe, die den zu so klein waren, haben wir gekriegt. Wir waren mit sechs Kindern. Six kinder? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You? Yeah. Six kinder? Oh, yeah. Und Mutter alleine. Und die hat uns Kleider von denen uns noch geben, was zu klein war, weil wir arm waren. Und Wir sind öfters mal, hat meine Mutter besucht. Bis zum Schluss. Aber es war gut, dass es sich früh genug fortgesetzt nach Amerika. Mhm. Gell? Früh. Ja, und. Aha. Wann ist die gestorben? Also mit den Kindern haben wir gespielt und auch darum gemacht, aha, gell? Aha. Ja. Aha. Und äh, wir waren keine, nicht Nazi. Ab, äh, Die Juden auch, hm. wir wie Juden, gell? Hm. Hm. Und wir haben sie geschützt. Hm. Hm. Aber wir konnten nichts machen. Äh, wir wurden auch verfolgt. Hm. Wir nehmen an, Ortsgruppenleiter. Ortsgruppenleiter. Mussten wir auch Mund halten. Hm. 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 Ja, und Hanchen, die Mutter, habe ich auch noch gekannt. 
die hatte Alzheimer-Krankheit. Die Aha. nennt Aha. Aha. andere. Mm -hmm. Das war uh, Hansen's Mutter Esther. Had a, an Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's. Ja. Yeah. Wurde immer fort. So this is what happened on this trip to Breidenbach, when the notion of doing a video first began to flicker. I've had many years to think about what happened here and why. Obviously here, as everywhere in Germany, there were those who strongly and enthusiastically went along with the Nazis, and there were others who opposed, even hated what they were doing. The difference is that those who went along had the force of the government and police behind them. Anti-Semitism down through history has been used by different groups and regimes to advance their self-interests. They kept the flame of hatred alive. In this, the Nazis were no different. The Nazi goal was to prepare the German people politically and psychologically for war, to overcome the stigma of the loss of World War I and unite the population around fear of a common enemy and the glorious goal of empire, while suppressing anyone who opposed their agenda. Anti-Semitism and anti-communism were the German militarists' war on terror, and it obviously worked for them for a while. And when I was uh, a couple of years ago in Germany, the first thing, I went into a um, the restaurant and uh, they have uh, you could sleep there, there, you know, and was our next door neighbor. And he called up people I was very friendly with. And the first thing that person, Hans Weifenbach is his name, he said to me was, you know, that bully, he was killed on the Russian front. <laughs> Even though there was, uh, I never asked, I never mm -hmm. said, mm -hmm. that was his first voice, that he was killed on the Russian front which uh, the other people came when they heard mm -hmm. I was there and introduced themselves, which I didn't even recognize them. One of them had his jaw all out of place. Mm -hmm. He was in, in, on the Russian front, mm -hmm. but he came home. The thing they tell you right away is no matter where we were, we did nothing. <laughs> That was the well, that was the problem. They didn't do anything. <laughs> they <laughs> they, they didn't. Yeah. They really didn't. Mm -hmm. they, they tried to stay away from mm -hmm. things and didn't. But this Hans Weisenbach, he told me that he told your mother mm -hmm. to tell the others that uh, that the Nazis were coming that night, that they should get away. Yeah. 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 Uh, he mentioned it to mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm.